Amen. Well, the title of today's message is The Power of the Word. The Power of the Word of God. See, it's God's Word. He does everything through His Word. And Jesus is the Word of God. He's the living Word. God does everything through His powerful Word. Now, Scripture opens up in Genesis 1 and 1. It says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And verse 2 says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, See, God spoke it all into order. God's Word produces perfect order. You let God's Word reign over your life, and the Word of God is going to order your life. It'll get your life in order, having God's Word over your life. And he said, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day. This is verse 16, let's skip down. And the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth. Do you know, it's pretty amazing that if you take the earth, and you move the earth just a few feet closer to the sun, it's going to change everything. It could burn up, or you move the, the earth out of its, its orbit. I've, I've looked when the, the astronauts have seen pictures of the earth, and I've never seen a rod going through the middle of it, the axis, right? So what's holding up the earth? I'm going to tell you, it's his word holding everything in perfect order. His word is holding everything up. The seas obey the boundaries. Yeah, we have floods, but they got to go back to the boundaries. God sets all the boundaries through his mighty word. Now, Psalms 148.1 says this. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Praise ye him, sun, moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. So all the heavenly bodies are giving glory to God. It's, the other night we walked outside and Jupiter was aligned with the moon. And I don't know if y'all saw it. There was a beautiful halo. A beautiful, beautiful halo. And I was just shocked looking at that. I'm like, look how beautiful this is. It's amazing. Someone doesn't believe in God, you only have to go out at night and look at the stars. I won't say who it is, but there was one sister that was out in Picayune where the lights weren't shining. She goes, oh, they got more stars in Picayune. I said, no. <laughs> she knows who she is. I won't point her out. She says, sometimes the lights, the lights are so busy that you can't see the stars. And sometimes we get so busy, we don't notice what God has done. The lights of this world blind our eyes, and we don't notice all the glories of God. All we focus is on the negative things, but we don't focus on the beauty of God. When you take time to meditate on what God has done, and the glory of God, it's amazing. It'll blow your mind. Now he says in verse uh, 148.5, uh, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He also established them forever and ever. He also made a decree which shall not pass. Praise ye the Lord from the earth, ye dragons and all deeps. Fire and hail, snow, vapor, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. Everything's fulfilling his word. Now, all things in the universe, you may need to turn me down just a little bit, Chad. All things in the universe are literally upheld by his word. You know that old song we used to sing? He's got the whole world in his hands. Well, it's bigger than that. He's got the universe in his hands. The whole universe is in his hands. In his hands. That's amazing. Now, Hebrews 1.3 says this. Hebrews 1.3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and up, upholding all things by the word of his power. So he upholds everything by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, if you will, I want you to turn down those lights. And Nick, you could follow me with the camera because I will have a PowerPoint I want to show you. So you can turn down those lights. Turn down two and three. And Nick, if you could, uh, I'm going to come over here just because he's filming me over here. If you could pull a PowerPoint up for me. The power of his word. Now give me the next screen. Okay. Now this is the planets. Okay. Now remember, he's holding all this with his mighty word. Okay. Now this is earth, and earth looks like a pretty big place, doesn't it? I mean, if you, you ever travel on the earth, it takes, it takes many hours, you know, 12 hours to go to Israel. So the earth seems like a big place. And this is Mars, Mercury, Pluto, and of course Venus, right? So get to, let's see the next slide. Well, this is Jupiter in comparison to, look at look how small Earth is now. Earth's pretty tiny. Look at Pluto. Pluto just looks like a dot. So Mars is smaller. So here's the Earth. So you, how many Earths you can put in, in Jupiter? A lot of Earths inside of Jupiter. Now, you, you get a shrinking feeling as we're going to go on this. You'll get a real shrinking feeling. Uh, you know, the Bible says he knows the, the hairs on your head. So it's pretty amazing that God knows the number. Now, over the years, my number has decreased somewhat, how many hairs are on my head, but... He knows the numbers of the hair on your head. Give me the next slide. Now, this is the sun in comparison. So 
Here's Jupiter, and, and you follow on down, and, and look at Pluto. I mean, it's just a little pixel. Look at the Earth. I mean, you, can, you barely could see the Earth. It's as big as the red dot here. Look how many Earths we could fit inside of the sun. And he said, that's pretty big. Pastor Joe, that's pretty, that's pretty huge. Now, what's upholding all this? His word. His word is upholding all this. So just, just take the sun out of its orbit, and we'll just fry and toast. His, his word set the boundaries. Pull the, pull the next slide up. Now look at this. Here's the sun. Now, big, see how big the sun was compared to the earth? So, uh, it's, I mean, where's the earth at on here? It's just uh, not even, you can't even see it. Here's Cyrus and Pollux and Arcturus. Look how big Arcturus is, a star. This thing is huge. That's our sun, how big it was. I mean, you know, you, you think the earth is big. We can't even see us right now, but yet God sees you. The God who created all this created it for you. And it declares his handiwork. It declares his majesty. And we have people that say, people literally say, I don't want to know him. I don't want a relationship with him. Are you kidding me? The God that created all this wants a relationship with you. The God that made all this wants you to know him. Let's look at the next slide. This is Octorus. Now, this is Beltages here. Now, this is Octorus. Look how big, look how small it is now. Remember, I just showed you how big it was compared to the earth. So you can't even find the earth now. And, and, and here's uh, Aldebaran, Beltages, and Antares. Look how big this place is. You say, man, that is really big. You know, we, we could fit Arcturus in this, you know, 100 times over. So you get this shrinking feeling. So let's show you the next slide. Now here's the big dog here. Antares Canis Majoris. It would take 3,000 light years for you to travel a Canis Majoris at 186,000 mile, miles per second at the speed of light just to get there. Now, if you wanted to go around the planet just to check it out, and you traveled at 500 miles per hour, it'd take you 2,500 years. If you wanted to travel at the speed of light, it'd take you one year to go around this big bad boy. And God is upholding all this with the word of his power. Now, don't you think he can uphold you? Don't you think he can heal your body? Don't you think he can deliver you? He's upholding all this with his word. Wow, that's pretty impressive, isn't it? And that's it, Joe. I wanted to show you that. You can turn the lights on for me, if you will. Now, the Bible says in, uh, in Psalms 138 and 2 that God has exalted his word above his name. And it, said, it says this, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above thy name. He's lifted his word above his name. Now, God had spoke to me the other day. He said, son... Because I was saying, God, I just want to exalt your word. He said, son, some people will take my word and exalt their name. Use my word to lift themselves up. He said, but God wants to lift up his word even above his name. As holy as his name is, he wants to lift his word up above his name. Because everything's upheld by his word. Now, so often the Bible that you hold today. You know, people shed their blood that you might have that word. Of course, Jesus shed his blood. But people shed their blood and died that they might have the privilege of that word. In communist countries, they would tear page after page and they would share pages of the word of God, which we so freely have today and have free access to. You know, great men have said many things about the Bible. A lot of people have criticized the Bible, but the Bible always holds true. You know, one person tried to burn the Bible. And so I said, I'm going to burn it. And, and you know what scripture remained when, uh, out of the fragments of the fire? It said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will remain. God has the last word. This is what George Washington said about the Bible. It's impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. First president of the United States. It's Thomas Jefferson. A studious perusal of the sacred volume will make better citizens, better fathers, and better husbands. My God. We, we just celebrated 25 years of marriage. I'd like to thank everybody who helped out, my daughter, and did so much for the, uh, our 25th anniversary. They surprised us, by the way. I was getting hitched yesterday, and I didn't know it. I was, uh, came here to church and snuck me here. Glory to God. <laughs> I must be doing something right, because after 25 years, she said yes again. Glory to God. I mean, she could have said no again, but she, said, she never said no the first time. Wasn't a shotgun wedding, okay? She said yes. Yeah. So we reenacted that. That was a blessing. But the word of God is what kept our marriage together. Jesus is the glue that's going to keep it together. The word of God. Build your life on the word of God. It's a solid foundation. Our marriage is built on the word of God. Put everything on the word. It's, it's what you need to build on. Better husbands, better fathers. I didn't know how to love my wife until I got in the word. I had no idea. And you see, the word of God will teach you how to love your wife, how to love your husband, how to, how to teach your kids right. Because sometimes we, we just do what we were taught, right? 
And if you weren't taught right, you just replicate that, and it goes down generation to generation. Man, I want to break every generational curse and teach my kids the ways of God, the Word of God. And sometimes a teenager will say, well, Dad, I couldn't do this, I couldn't do that. You know what? I, I told my kids, I said, you lived in an oppression-free house. No devils, no, no oppression in your life. Raised you up according to the Word of God. See, the Word of God gives us freedom. You teach your kids God's Word, and it'll raise them up and make them great. It's a foundation to build on. Build your marriage. Build your home on the Word of God. Now, John Quincy Adams said this. It's the first and almost the only book deserving of universal attention. Give your attention to the Word of God. The Word of God will heal you. The Bible says the Word of God is medicine to your flesh. The Word of God will do it. Now, Andrew Jackson said this. It's the rock on which the republic rests. And isn't that the truth? You know, communist countries, there's a lot of books they'll allow, but they don't want the Word of God because the Word of God causes you to realize that God made you free to serve Him and worship Him and not to be under a totalitarian government. So they don't want the Bible. They kick the Bible out. And it is the rock on which this republic rests. And the nation is getting further and further from the Word of God. And the further we get from the Word of God, the further you get from God. And we get into trouble. And this nation's in trouble now. And my God, the church has got to get back to preaching the Word of God. I'm talking denominationally across the board. Preaching what God said about it. But what God said about every situation. We've got to build on the Word of God. Woodrow Wilson said this. A man has deprived himself of the best there is in the world who has deprived himself of this knowledge of the Bible. You know, I thank God that our young people go off to college and they learn an education, but you need to teach your young people how to get a hold of the Word of God, how to get a hold of God in prayer, how to grab the horns of the altar and know how to, know how to seek God because there's some things in life that you, an education is not, gonna, not going to help you with when you've got to know where to live, who to marry, how am I going to get through this situation. You better know how to pray the Word. You better know there's going to be situations in life that are just too big for you, just like these planets, how big they are. There's some things, there's some things that only God, He's got to step in. You just, I don't know what to do, God. I have no idea. You better know how to pray. And you better know the Word. Because the Word will deliver you. God has delivered me time and time and time again. Glory to God. To Him be all glory. It was who, Herbert Hoover said this. There's no other book so various as the Bible, not one so full of concentrated wisdom. The Bible talks about the wisdom of the just. You know, every problem is a wisdom problem. If you get in the Word of God, you're going to get full of wisdom. Full of God's wisdom for every situation that you face in life. God's wisdom will fill your life. Ulysses S. Grant said this. To the, to the influence of this book, we are indebted for the progress made in civilization. And to this, we must look as our guide in the future. Doesn't matter what you did yesterday. Are you building your life in the Word today? Did you make a decision? Say, I'm going to live for God today. You know, the devil can't stop you in that. When you say, I'm going, I choose to serve God. I choose to serve God today. You make a choice, say, I'm serving God. Come hell and high water, devil. You see, when the devil tries to knock you down, get up again, say, I'm serving God. I'm serving God. He may knock you down, but get up. Say in your face, Satan, I'm going to serve him anyway. I'm going to obey. He says, well, look, you just fell. Say, look, I'm up. I'm standing. I was watching the movie, and uh, there was this boxer, and he was getting beat up, and he, he, all he could say was, I'm still standing. I'm still standing. God will help you to stand. He'll give you the strength to stand, and he'll cause you to overcome the enemy and crush him under your feet. He'll make you a deliverer of other people. He'll cause you to deliver other people. You've got the victory in Christ. Jesus is in your corner. And he'll give you the strength and the ability that you need to overcome everything that you face. God's given you sufficient grace for it. Amen. Psalm 144, 15 says, Happy is that people that is in such case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. I'm here to tell you. I, I tell God this. I'll tell you this. I thank God that I can study his holy word. I rejoice over his word. I want to study his word for time and eternity. It's wonderful. I love being saved. You say you believe in once saved, always saved. I'm not looking to get out. I'm enjoying myself. I love being saved. I'm free in Christ. I'm free in Christ to walk with him and talk with him and serve him. Man, I wake up in the anointing. Look, it's not just in church where I feel his presence. I wake up in my bed. Oh, I feel it. I wait, you know, I'm, I'm telling you. Was it about feelings? No, but I tell you, he's there. He lets me know he's there. Amen. Glory to God. In my office today, I felt his presence just right next to me. Standing right, I mean, I know it was an angel. It was him. I just felt... Glory all about me. Praise God. Doesn't just have to be in church. When you go to the restaurant, His presence goes with you. You can rejoice and I am happy being saved. God wants to put a smile on your face and in His presence there's fullness of joy in His presence. So be happy that He is your God. So the Bible is more than a book. You know, if I wrote a book and I wanted you to understand my book, 
And you came to me and said, you know, Pastor Joe, what did you mean when you wrote this book? I could explain it to you. But if I said, let me do this, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my spirit and put it in you so you can know exactly what I meant when you read it. So you'll read it and you'll get an instant revelation of what I wanted you to know because my spirit is now in you. You say, wow, that's pretty simple. Well, what happened is God put his spirit in us. And the, the Bible is a spiritual book. So when you read it with the eyes of the Holy Ghost, all of a sudden you're going to get a revelation down on the inside of you. You're going to get a revelation on the inside. And you're going to realize, wow, this is God speaking to me. You know, when Jesus was here in the flesh, many people didn't recognize him. It's when they got the Holy Ghost, when they got the power of God, the, the Spirit of God within, they begin to get revelation of who he was and who he is. So it's the Holy Ghost that teaches us all things on the inside. So when you read his book, you're going to have understanding that you never had. When I got saved, I knew something had happened because I was, I was raised in a denomination. I went to catechism classes. But when I read the word of God, I started understanding like I had never understood. The Bible talked about manna falling from heaven. And I said, oh, that's Jesus. That's symbolic of the word of God and Jesus. Nobody had to tell me that. I turned on the radio and I heard Dr. So-and-so saying that. Which, by the way, you want to have your doctorate in Christ? Yes, I do. It's called Ph.D., past having doubt. That's your doctorate. Not post hole digger, past having doubt. You got to know God. When you know, see, I quit believing a long time ago, and I know in whom I have believed. I know he's God. If Jesus showed up and showed me his nail-scarred hands and the holes in his feet, I'm not going to go, oh, now I believe. I already believe. I know that's so. See, how do I know that's so? The Holy Ghost made it real to me. The Holy Ghost will make it real to you. He'll make them so real to you. One day you'll step over. You'll just step from this life right on into glory. Praise God when that day comes. He makes God real to you. Amen? Well, you can clap your hands if you want to. Glory to God. It's for God. I get excited, man. Praise God. That's what Napoleon Bonaparte said. The Bible is more than a book. It is a living being with an action, a power which invades everything that opposes its extension. He's going to have the omega. God is the alpha and the omega. He's going to have the last word. It's also said, uh, Daniel Webster, who wrote the dictionary, says the Bible is a book of faith, a book of doctrine, and a book of morals, a book of religion, of special revelation from God. But it is also a book which teaches man his responsibility, his own dignity and equality with his fellow man. The Bible will raise your life. Listen, you can live on the low ebb of life if you want, but you live according to his word, and God's going to raise you in the high places of life. It'll raise you up. It'll strengthen you. It'll, it'll cause your marriage to prosper, your kids to prosper. Everything in life will prosper when you get the word. Curses will be broken. The Lord just, as I'm talking to you right now, I feel like I need to tell you this. You may have heard me say this, but people are operating, some people are under a curse, and they can't seem to get ahead. They're trying to get ahead, and something's holding them back. The Word of God will set you free so you can become all you can be. You can be, it wasn't that an army thing, be all you can be, but with God, be all you can be in Christ. I, I need to share this with you, and you may have heard me say this, but I believe the Lord wants me to say it again. Some time ago, I think it was 2003 or so, I, I went to prayer. I wasn't pastoring at the time. I was driving in my car, and I got up on Rampart Street, and this is what the Lord said to me. It's so plain. He said to me, I want you to break the curse off of the New Orleans Saints. It's exactly what he said to me, and I was shocked. I wasn't talking football. I had come from prayer. I was talking to God about many things, but football was not one of them, and I said, what do you mean, God? They're cursed? He said, yes, break the curse off of them. He said, many people have spoke negative over them for many years, and I want you to break it. So I said, okay. I said, in the name of Jesus, I break the curse off the wall and saints. I pronounce blessing and I decree goodness and mercy. And I just, a simple prayer. And I told a sister at church this and she just kind of laughed at me. She's like, yeah, right. You know, she was a heavy saints fan and painted her fingernails, the saints colors and everything. So she wasn't believing me. So I said, look, I'm just telling you, you know, I, I, God told me this. Well, what would happen was Ricky Williams was playing and the papers came out and said, Ricky Williams, hex buster. That's what it came out. I said, he's not the hex buster, Jesus is. Jesus is the hex buster, and he'll be the hex buster in your life, too. Glory to God. Well, the day came when they won their first playoff, and she walked into church, and I was there at the time. I was playing in the music ministry, playing guitar. She just said, I believe you, I believe you, I believe you. And she threw the paper down in front of me, and the time speaking you, and the headline said, the curse is lifted. The headline said, the curse is lifted. I'm here to tell you, Jesus wants to lift curses off of your life that's been holding you back. And the word of God will set you free and you'll rise up to heights you've never believed possible in your life. You'll have businesses, you'll have dreams and prosperity. The word of God will do that for you. He breaks all that garbage off of your life. Now, if God cares about a football team, I mean, God, it was God that initiated that. Cares about a football team and being cursed. How much more does he care about his children that he wants to be set free and serving him? with nothing operating against them. Praise God. Thank you, God. Now, there's many people that have mocked and scorned the Word of God. They mock and scorn the Word today, and, and they don't believe it. 
There was a French philosopher, Voltaire. you may have heard of him. He was a skeptic who destroyed the faith of many people, many, many people. He boasted that within 100 years of his death, the Bible would disappear from the face of the earth. That's what he said. He died in 1728. Now, God always gets the last word. Here's the irony of this. 50 years after his death, the Geneva Bible Society moved into his former house and used his house as a printing press for thousands and thousands of Bibles. <laughs> Listen, I got, I got to tell you a personal experience. I know my family will be watching my TV, but it's true. Uh, every holiday, Christmas and, you know, times we'd go by my grandfather's house. My grandfather was an atheist. And when I was a little kid, I used to sit down with him and say, look at my hand, Grandpa. Look at my hand. Say, this is amazing. This didn't just happen. This, you know, I didn't, you didn't come from monkeys. You know, when you get to heaven, you're not going to see this. <laughs> on the throne. Okay? <laughs> not, not happen. God's not a chimpanzee, right? We made the image and likeness of God. I said, look at this, Grandpa, this is pretty awesome. God did this, and he wasn't believing, right? Well, holidays would come around, he'd get up and talk about evolution, I'd get up and talk about Jesus. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer. Well, if, if Jesus would appear to me and told me what I'm about to tell you, I wouldn't have believed it. You see, they said, what are you going to do with this, his house? I, was, I wanted to say, demo that house. He had passed on, and I was like, destroy that house, just bulldoze it. It's a, you know, a money pit. Well, Hurricane Katrina hit, moved behind my uncle's house, and I had no other place to move but his house. I had to move into the money pit. And the Lord wants me to tell you this too. Two years prior to this, I had a dream. And I, in a dream, I was standing, and this is, this is one of those creepy dreams. I was standing in the foyer of his house, looking up at the stairs, rebuking a demonic spirit, and a spirit that looked like a monkey, about six foot, ran down the steps and ran out the wall. And it seemed really, really real. I woke up, and I told my wife, I said, I think I saw a spirit of evolution, demonic spirit of evolution. So when I moved in this house, I got the Holy Ghost. This place was so creepy, and, it, and there was no power at the time. Power was out. It had been like this for a while. It was so creepy, I had to put some things in the, in the, the house. So I'd open the front door and just kind of push them in. <laughs> I didn't want to come in there. <laughs> so I had to move out of a trailer. My wife was in Texas, and she was coming back here. So I remember it was 10 o'clock one night, and, and she, my wife was coming, so I was getting power on the next day. And I'm like, why does it have to be at night? But I had to go pray over this house. So I'm standing across the street. I said, okay, devil, there's a new sheriff in town. Somebody's got to go, and it's not going to be me. So I, I literally put my hands like this, like the old West. <laughs> I did. And I went into the house, and I'm going to tell you what. I was, you ever, you've been to some place you feel like, man, there's something in here, and, you, and you, you, your hair is coming up. That's how it was. I was like, mm -hmm. And I was going to all the rooms, and I'm praying. I'm like, devil, get out of here. I went through the whole house. I closed the door. Thank God I'm out of there. But it was still in there. So the next night, they had the lights on, at least this time. At least I felt better with the lights. Same deal. Went over to the house and, man, I'm going to pray again. So I start praying, and on the mantelpiece, there was a statue of a monkey reading a newspaper. And the Holy Ghost said, get rid of that. Get rid of that. Symbolic evolution. And uh, I took that down, and it's a three-level house. I walked down to the bottom steps, and I said, in the name of Jesus, devil, I'm casting you out. And I grabbed the door, and the door went boom, and it split from the top to the bottom, two inches off of the hinges. Solid door. So I took that thing and destroyed it. And what really got me mad is the devil broke my door. Then I had a rat problem while I was living there. I had to get a new door. <laughs> I'm just going to say this. My family may, you know, they'll probably see this on television. But my, my grandpa had an atheist book. So when I was spackling the house, I chose that book to use as my, for my spackling knife, the atheist book. Spackled all over it. And we started. <laughs> in your face, Satan. So we started the church. My church checks had his address on it. God gets the last word. God gets the last word. So you might as well get on his side. Get on his side. It's the winning team. I mean, how would you know if you wanted to play him? Doesn't everybody like to win? It's not how you play the game. You know, I want to win. I want to win when I play baseball, football, whatever. Winning's normal. Increase is normal to life. Jesus is the winning team. You win. I read the end of the book. You win. Devil zero. God wins. Amen. Jesus is the winner. Matter of fact, if you weren't in that message, I said, every time you come to church, just raise your hands. And what you're saying is, I win. I win. Touchdown. I win. Glory to God. I win. Raise your hands. You're a winner. Thank you, God. I said earlier, communist nations want to get rid of the word because it sets people free. You know, in those nations, they have a high alcoholism rate, prostitution, so many things because they're in bondage bondage of sin, the word of God will liberate you to the freedom that God wants you to have. 
Now, there's 12 symbols of the Word of God. One of them is a fire to refine. His Word is a fire. I tell you, it'll, get a, it'll become a fire shut up in your bones. There was a time I, I even said to God, I'm not going to tell anybody anything. I'm, I'm not going to talk to them. I, I was going to hold it in, but I couldn't hold it in. It was a fire burning inside of me. And His Word is a fire to refine. You know what, what metals, like I have a ring here on my finger, and pure gold is actually transparent like this pulpit. And you get to heaven, this is what the streets look like. They're transparent like pure gold. God wants us to have hearts like this, by the way, that are transparent, pure gold. But, you know, pure gold by itself is pretty mushy. You can't do much with it. You have to use other metals as an alloy. But what they do with fire is they, they heat up the metals, and the dross comes to the top, and you take the ladle, and you, you take out the dross, and this process goes on to keep taking the dross out, okay, out of the metals. Now, the, the refiner who does this with the metals, he knows that the metal is pure when he sees his reflection of himself in the, the pot. And see, that's what God's doing to you. Some of us, you may be going through the fire, and the fire is causing the dross to come out of your life, and God's looking for his reflection in you. See, you're becoming more and more like Christ. It's a process. It's a process, and he's going to keep refining you, keep refining you, as silver tried seven times in a furnace. So the word is a fire to refine us and make us holy, make us pure, because God's looking to see himself in you. The, the Bible says his word is a hammer that breaks uh, the rocks in pieces. And the scripture is the same one, Jeremiah 23 and 29. And it's a, it's a hammer to convict. Uh, in Acts, it says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know, this is Acts 2.36, Assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The word of God will break that, the hardest heart. Your heart may be hard. Maybe you were betrayed. Maybe you, some of us have, have been molested and hurt and things have happened in life. And we harden our heart like the old Pat Benatar song. I'm going to harden my heart. I'm going to swallow my tears. Remember that? It, it was, that's what the world does. They get hard. And it shows on your face. You, eat a lemon. It's going to show on your face. You, know, you, you give a baby a lemon. You want the lemon. Some of us look like that because we've hardened our heart. You've been betrayed, you love that person, and they betrayed you. Better to have loved and been betrayed than never to have loved at all. You keep sowing love, you're going to reap love. So don't harden your heart and wall yourself in. The only, thing, the only person you keep out is everyone else. You start, I'm putting a wall up to keep everybody out, and you stand behind your bars of your self-imposed prison sentence, and you say, now I'm keeping everybody out, and you're miserable. You lock everybody up. 